I uh, might take a moment to cry. for fun, so I'm going to shift into that real quick. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and glad we are well and came. And we're thinking of all the people now all over the world who may not be here. And we are very grateful and fortunate. I certainly am, and I'm certainly fortunate to be with you all. And all the people who couldn't be with us today, you know who you are. I've told people that this has been a long pregnancy <laughs> and labor. <laughs> and um, now they're going to a new birth. And so I think the rain is a great metaphor for all that today. A great cleansing. Um, it's If you want some rain and a cool day, come here. Because it's, it's quite nice. So... Um, OCO, which is the low in Cherokee, welcome, um, namaste, namaskar, satriakology, ciao, hola, um, all those languages, uh, people have been here, people say, when are you opening? Well, since Manitou Cave of Alabama formed in 2016, uh, with no advertising, no marketing, people from nine countries and 26 states have come to see this cave. Because of many of you who've done amazing research that's been published, that has gained international attention. And for this, I'm very grateful. And I know uh, Manitou Cave is too. So it's now uh, come a long way. What you will learn today, um, I have about 30 minutes to, to start uh, with the history of Manitou Cave, which goes back 320 million years, which is a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> right? One million per minute. Yeah, maybe so. And so um, having said that, um, we know what history means is that it's his story. And that means the written word. And there's lots of stories that are her story before his story. And most of the life of Manitou has been that. So his story is the stuff that we know about that has been written. And that has been fairly recent in the life of, of um, excuse me, you know, someone needs to be at the desk and because uh, people are just driving in. And, it's, the, it's the caterer. It's the oh, it is? Okay, yeah, good. Caterer. Okay, caterer's coming. <laughs> I guess it's noon already. <laughs> and I'm still at two, two three. Uh, okay, come on in. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, so. So having said that, I'm going to cover that part of the history, of the written part. But I do want to briefly say, because we do have some expert uh, cavers here, and they could talk for a long time, but this cave is especially significant, although there are thousands of caves in this tag region, which is the Tennessee, North, North um, Alabama, North Georgia tag region, limestone caves, they're all over the place. This one is very significant for a lot of reasons. Not only is it significant geologically, but also biologically. Um, ben Miller knows about that and other people who've done research on the um, rare cave snail that's actually named after Dr. Brewer, <laughs> Antroris breweri, because it was named, it has, this snail got in the cave and somehow fell in love with it like I did and decided to live there. And so all this time has crawled around in the dark, lived in that pure water, found food somehow, and that's not easy to do when you're blind. 
not as a bat, but as a blind snail, and has survived, and it is now being protected. And isn't that a marvelous thing? Because it, is, it has been on the threatened list. The next stage up is to be um, endangered, and what happens after that is it's extinct. And we know all the big animals of the world that are becoming extinct, let alone the little ones, and we don't know what half of them do in our whole ecosystem that we are a part of. I love when I give tours, I say to people, show me where your lungs are, and they go here, and I say, and that's to half your lungs. Your other half are all around here. And people don't realize how we connected, and we appreciate oxygen now, don't we? especially during these times. So I want to say that. But the other thing is culturally, this cave is very important. Very, very important. Dr. Shemek um, joined us today, and I'll be speaking a little bit about the, the work that he has led up in the cave with um, the culture part of the Cherokees that lived here. And you won't believe this, uh, people in Alabama know a whole lot about the Creeks and um, that those uh, nations, but not really too much of that the Cherokees lived here. So what we have to think about is the world as a living being, but she really doesn't know, she didn't name the oceans and the countries and the landmarks, and she didn't know when you passed from Georgia into Alabama. You see, we, we made that, we have all that writing, but all that's interconnected and we are too, we're part of it all. So. That's the cultural part that's so beautiful about the Cherokees living here. They lived in eight states. And this was the farthest down they, they came when everything else was taken away. And so that, that's how they got here. And a lot of people do not realize that. So we have educated even the people in Alabama about that. Um, and of course the history that you're gonna hear lots about today uh, most importantly, we know now how the cave was used by the Cherokees, who was in there. There's dates and, and, and signage dating back from 1814. You can walk in there, and right when you walk in in the rock shelter, you can see a fossil in the wall when all of this was under the sea. And Lookout Mountain was the bottom of the sea. That's right. And you can see that the, the little critter that lived in there, this was even before fish were here, and this was just the shells of, 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 of the critters that lived in here. Right next to that is modern day spray paint, neon spray paint graffiti. So going in there is a walk through time and history. Um, Alan Kressler once said, uh, who's on our board and a, a wonderful uh, naturalist and caver and photographer, he said, this is a living natural museum. And it's alive and it's going well, especially now that it's being protected. So that, uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased about that. And before I go any further, I do want to just remind you, so many people are asking me when you're gonna open because people that live around here remember this place as a show cave. Some people are here were guides or helped build it, and this was during the 60s and a little part of when um, Dr. Brewer um, had the property. And so, skipping over that a little bit, what happened was a lot of, when you're gonna open, well I'm saying we have been open, but it's been by appointment, like going to a fine restaurant. That's how I see it. Not like, it wasn't fast food. You're going to a really fine restaurant and you make an appointment. And I have learned over the years, culturally, especially in these days, not to say make a reservation. So I'm going to, um, I'd love to talk a lot about this, but I only have um, another minute. So I'm gonna <laughs> skip over a lot of this and talk to you, um, skip over to 1838, okay? And you can read more about it on our new posters that just arrived last night, by the way, just for you. Um, so we're very happy about that. So we, uh, Shannon mentioned this was Wills Town. You know, there's a Wills Creek and there's a Wills Valley. 
Well, Will lived here, and he was a Cherokee. And so this was Will's town. He was an important guy. And so it was named after him. And um, we know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some dates, because when we take history in school, we learn a lot of those dates. And when we're young, they're kind of boring, right? And uh, you don't get it. And, you, and then most of them are like wars, history with dates and wars and this sort of stuff. And so 1838 was the Trail of Tears from here on this route. And, and we're going to talk about that later in detail. I'm, I'm just going to say that now. But just understand that took place here and what was important about this cave and the research that was done. And Dr. Dr. Shamakir, you want to let everybody know who you are so they can bombard you afterwards with questions? <laughs> and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, he's been here many, many times and has researched many, many caves and is an authority. Came back down here from Knoxville. Anyway, what I wanted to say was, this is what I want you to remember about Alabama. We just celebrated the bicentennial of the statehood of Alabama. Now that was 1819. Okay? Territory was 1817. The Indian Removal Act was 1830. The Trail of Tears was 1838. This was still Willstown. See? All during that time. And guess who was living here? Sequoia. Uh, the trees were named after Sequoia. He was a big giant man. And so what he did while he was here in Willstown, he invented and created the Cherokee writing system, which no Indian nation had ever had. They talked to each other. They had other ways of communicating, many other ways, but they didn't need to write. But when he saw this diaspora of people from eight states having to leave their homeland across the Mississippi, out to Indian Territory, out west, I think, this is my own opinion, I think he kind of had a good intuition that we better figure out a way to communicate. And so it saved the culture and they ended up, even today, to be one of the best and um, in, in the whole country. So I think that's amazing and I'll tell you a little secret. Having read so much about Sequoia, and there's not that much, I have a little crush on him. <laughs> He's kind of like my sugar granddad. <laughs> and so I'm really happy to celebrate him today. So I just want you to understand those dates. And when I kind of figured all that history out, it was kind of disturbing to me. And then I understood more and had more compassion for the Trail of Tears, you see. They were living here, this was still their town, and didn't want to leave, and really um, wanted to stay here, and did everything that the settlers and the Euro-Americans asked to do as far as assimilating and being part of the culture. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, there are signatures in there from the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, some of the Cherokees fought in that, and Sequoia did too. And they, they, their signatures and their, the dates are in the cave, and you can see that. Um, probably the most important one in there that makes this cave so special and significant is that Sequoia's son um, wrote in there, and you can read all about this. It's on our website and in many other places. The research that was done actually by Bo Duke Carroll, who was a Ch Eastern Band of Cherokee, who was doing his master's thesis under Dr. Shemek at University of uh, Tennessee in Knoxville. Now, if you complain about going in traffic and traveling, you think about going from Cherokee, North Carolina to Knoxville when you have a wife and kids and are working and working on your master's. And, you know, I had so much respect when I found out that, you know, from our point of view, we love archaeology. We think it's pretty great. 
digging up ancestors' bones and putting them in museums and all their artifacts. But if they were your ancestors, your people, you might feel differently. So I, I grew to understand that more and how much courage it took for him to do this and how important this is. Um, and what's so beautiful about the paper that he wrote, his master's thesis about this cave and the research that was done and all it was translated, it took years. I didn't think it would ever be published, frankly, right? I didn't know if, if, the, if the Cherokee would ever want this published because it's so beautifully written from the point of view and the wisdom of a Cherokee, not from our point of view. And that's really beautiful. So I did want to mention that. So you can see that in there, and uh, we'll learn more about that later in another talk, so hang, hang around. But Sequoia Sun, and that's dated 1828, when they still lived here. Very important work. And then later, it uh, gained international attention uh, with a paper that Dr. Dr. Shemek was um, uh, part of an antiquity journal, an archeolo international archeologic journal. And I'm telling you, it was in newspapers in Japan and New York Times, all over the world. You can look in a book in there, I have sort of, it's full of these kind of articles about this. And um, he warned me, he said, it's gonna be published. You better put up a website. And I launched one that day. And sure enough, I haven't had time yet to, um, updated, but it will be soon. And we're going to skip over to the Civil War. You can go in there. That research has been done by Marion O. Smith in the 90s. Um, he's an expert caver and historian, and then he went in there, and um, there's a bunch of, this was, this was mined for saltpeter during the Civil War. You can go in there, and you can actually see tally marks. You can see, and he, he, he researched the miners' payrolls, and there's nine signatures in there from that time of the miners in there. So that's all published research, and we know that's authentic. and been, um, So that's all part of the tour, too. You can see all that. People seem to like that a whole lot, because that's sort of about a history that you know about. Do you like our environmental sound? <laughs> we have chickens, rain, and you asked for it. I love this place. They keep the bugs down here too, excuse me. Now, what's happening in Fort Payne now is a big thing that happened here. And that was 1888. 1888 was uh, we call the boom days. And they have a festival every year. You're probably going, right? Already been. You, you already been. <laughs> you're, you do it every year. And um, it's a big deal, even though the boom days only lasted a short time. And who did that was the industrialists. Remember, this was the, in the turn of the century was the Industrial Revolution. The northern industrialists from Boston, New York, they all came down looking for coal and iron. Well, of course, they found it in Chattanooga. They found it in Birmingham. They thought it was going to be here. So they came here, and they looked everywhere. They mined for a couple years, built a, a big community. Um, there was an opera house. I mean, how many places in Alabama have an opera house, right? Um, a big hotel, uh, really amazing stuff, um, a, a, a depot, railroad depot, which is now a museum. And they even, with this cave, when they found this and went in it, they were like, wow, this is something. So they made this the first tourist attraction in Alabama. Now, isn't that cool? And they made the spur line from the railroad depot to the top of this property. Uh, everybody goes there on four wheelers now, don't they? Dexter, uh-huh, my neighbor. He's pretty good, and uh-huh. That was the old railroad bed, did you know that? Okay, you're good. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he, Dexter helps take care of the property. He's one of my good neighbors. Um, he's working on security today. You see how hard he's working over there? <laughs> good guy. He's a good guy, and so is his dad. I love them both. So anyway, they, so they built all these wooden steps coming down from the train, and you can see pictures of this. 
I mean, there's ladies in their dresses and stuff, and they had balls in there. There's a big 90 by 60 ballroom in there, a cavernous room that has great acoustics. Hey, you had a birthday party, didn't you? You had a big birthday. People are still talking about your birthday party, Dr. Brewer. I mean, I know what it took to put this event. I can't imagine hauling in 450 feet of chairs and tables and candles and bands and what ought not. So I'm sure it was quite a party. So it was, yeah. <laughs> He's still smiling about that. So... Uh, so that was used that way, and I still get requests. You know, my 13-year-old wants a birthday party in the ballroom. And we have another um, mission now, you know, because people remember those, those times. So that was the boom days. They're having a festival today, so you can go after our event and enjoy. Uh, but they celebrate every year. But that took place here, and this was the tourist attraction. Isn't that cool? Yes, yes, that's it, that's it. Then, what had, so the, the, the Fort Payne Coal and Iron Company purchased it, and it was called the Fort Payne Cave at the time, and it was really, um, um, or the Niter Works, I guess. But they, when, when they purchased it, um, yeah, they, I think that's when it got its Manitou name. That's the documentation. Now, a lot of people say, and there's, if you Google this, it'll say Manito is a Cherokee word and means spirit. Well, that's not correct, right? <coughs> not correct. Well, you know that's not correct. It's actually Ojibwe, and it makes a lot of sense to me um, because who named it were these people from the north. And that's where those, those uh, original people and the nations lived, the Algonquin. And so they were more familiar with those tribes than they were with the southern ones. So they named that Manitou, which does mean spirit. You know, there's Manitoba in Canada. So that's interesting. And you can, you can look up Manitou Cave and lots of things will pop out. That's why I specifically say of Alabama. This is very specific here. There's a Manitou Cave in Colorado, actually, too. So we have, we have upgraded that so we know where this location is. It's Manitou Cave of Alabama. So if you're reading about it, you'll know that this is documented research. I don't make this stuff up. I don't believe everything I've heard, you know, that this cave goes all through, you know, everywhere and all those kinds of things. It may have at one time. So um, we're going to skip over to the 1900s real quick and really I'm almost done because we're almost at the 200s and but what happened then um, in 1903 the Walter Raymond family purchased the property and they owned it for 75 years and during that time some of that time a good bit of that time actually nothing was done here well in the 50s after World War II you know, people were traveling more, and so show caves became very popular around the country. Show caves are those ones that you've probably been to them. They have lights, and they say, look at this, this looks like, you know, a dragon, and this looks like a this, and all that. Well, they spent 10 years in this cave building hundreds of steps, and I want to tell you they go up and down. I've tried counting them, never have been able to make it. There's nine steel and wooden bridges. It took 10 years. They landscaped this whole property, which was a lot bigger at the time. They dammed up the pure cave stream water, and there's springs out here, dammed it up and made a big lake, put fish in it. I still hear stories about the fishing. They put, I think there were koi or something in there, they, the way they describe them. There was a boat. These picnic tables out here were, um, built about the same time as, uh, from the same forms as the Corps of Engineer from DeSoto State Park. So it has a lot of history. Now this visitor center that you see, it's like, okay, that's cute. Well, that was the visitor center for everybody traveling 35 and 11, going north and south and east and west through Alabama. They came here, it was a great place. You get a concession, you get a little gift shop, um, bathrooms, 
little lake, let the kids run around, have your lunch, and then for a couple bucks, you go in this cave. 58 degrees year round. Nobody had air conditioning. No cars. You remember, you're shaking your head. Mm -hmm. I remember. Not in your car, not in your home. So to go in a cool place like this was really neat. So it was very, very popular. Uh, hundreds of people came a day. Hundreds. And then what happened was I-59 opened. And like in so many small towns, everybody zoomed by. I sure did. Do you know, I, I lived in Alabama 50 years, came as an adult. I am a grandmother. And I never stopped here, ever, until I came to see this cave. The cave brought me here. She called me. <laughs> kind of like that. So that's, we've all zoomed by, right? Zoom by. Don't pay attention. So anyway, that, so that's what happened. And so, and you probably remember more about that, and you'll have to give your own talk sometime about those times. <laughs> But um, it closed down, and people stopped really coming as much. And that was after all that work and all that uh, effort and all that money. Can you imagine doing all that today? No. Mm -mm. So what happened was after that, um, you came along. And, um, oh, during that time, uh, Governor George Wallace visited. There's, there's photos of him. You can look that up. We have a nice archive of pictures. So he came here. That might have been the last time a governor's been here. I, you know, I want, I want our, doctor, uh, our governor now to come. Then during the 50s, some of you remember this, uh, during the Cold War, everybody was getting fallout shelters because of nuclear nuclear bombs were in Cuba. I, I lived in Miami. I know all about that. And they were pointed 90 miles to the United States. That's pretty close. So everybody was building these fallout shelters. This was a fallout shelter. There were medical supplies, uh, water, big water barrels, uh, cracker cans. There's still a whole bunch of them in there, which you can see. So that was from the fallout shelter days. So that's part of the history. Um, in the 70s, um, there's a lot of dates about this, so I'm not exactly sure, but in the early 70s, one of those, <coughs> Dr. Brewer purchased it, right? 75, 76, something like 72, there's a lot of different dates around there. And during that time, it was, you got it listed on the um, Alabama Register of Landmarks and Heritage. So that was a great thing. Buildings are usually on historic preservation sites, but this, this got that designation. But now that we have completely rehabilitated and restored this building and all that we know now, I think this is a real good candidate for a national um, registration. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, yes, we got, we got some applause on that. Yes. So, but then it was closed as after, after we had our party. <laughs> we made sure to have a good birthday party. Well, during the 90s, a couple great things happened. That was when I've already mentioned that that's when the Manitou Cave Snail was, um, was identified and named. Um, and so that uh, was really an important time. And, and we've already talked about that. Also, we talked about in the 93 is when the publication came of the Saltpeter um, so now we're into the OOs, the great OOs. And so, like I said, I've never been here. I don't want to talk about myself, but I'm not from here. I'm not a Cherokee. I'm um, not a caver. I'm not a crazy cat lady. <laughs> uh, and I absolutely do not have deep pockets, you know, at all. I do not own it. But like-minded people do, and it's an LLC. A lot of people say, oh, yes, you do. No, I didn't want to do anything like that, like I'm flipping something. You know, like people are flipping houses now. Uh-uh. I don't get anything out of that except I love this place. You know how love is? 
And so I feel like the grandmother, the mother, sometimes the sheriff, the principal. I get on everybody's nerves. I don't like her very much. You know, I, I like fun in that. <laughs> I like dancing in that. But that's what it takes here to protect her. And right at the beginning, and I'm not going to go into that because I'm way over time, but right at the beginning, we formed a, a I, I saw all the interest. People wanted to come see it because I was so in love. And I, and I was trying to find out about this cave, and I couldn't find out about it. And so they said, well, we want to go see, we want to go see. So every time I'd knock on Dr. Brewer's dentist door, you remember, don't you? And it's like, oh, here she is again. <laughs> here she is again. What do you want to look at? He's already folding his hands. Want and he said, picture. huh? Want another picture. Yeah, yeah, I, that's right. I always took pictures, and I document everything. And, and I'd say, listen, there's a group that wants to come. Is it okay? Oh, sure. Because he wanted to sell it. I mean, I was no fool. You wanted to sell it. And I thought, well, certainly somebody. I mean, so many people loved it. And I thought, certainly someone will, you know, love it that much to buy it. Well, somebody did. And it's not me, but I love it. And I didn't want to own it because I'd given everything away already. I'm old. And... Um, but anyway, what happened was, and I want to tell you, there was a wonderful board we formed. And it was um, Kathy Havenhauer, who was here for many years. A lot of you know her. Fabulous old friend from my Birmingham days. And um, LaDonna Smith, who's in Birmingham. They all loved it. And we formed the board. And this was our mission, which we have stuck to. We are mission-centric since day one. And I'm going to say it because it's very different than a lot of other caves or places even, and that is to respect and protect this historic sacred site through conservation, <clears throat> education, so that the cave, the land, and the water are preserved for the visitors and the wildlife as a place of peace. Um, so I, want, I need to wrap this up. Oh, I'm doing pretty good, actually. I, mean, I thought I was way over time, but I'm doing... You have five minutes? <laughs> five minutes over? Well, that's, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. That's not bad for me. I'm, you know, I'm a storyteller, so I'm skipping over a lot. My daughters, they check on me every day, and they'll call and say, Hi, Mom, how you doing? I'm going through the drive through Bye. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, but thank you for listening. One of the best things that happened before the cave could be purchased, because at the time, and Dr. Brewer knows this, there was a lot going on in there. Because for many, many years, nothing was going on, and people found out, and there was a lot of partying going on, some illegal activities. You can, I mean, we all were teenagers. I never did anything like that, but you just, teenagers want to have fun. But also, there was a lot of vandalism, and people who know about caves, they know all about that. And you know, traditionally, I think you taught me this, traditionally caves, and um, my board member uh, and a good friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Shoti, she knows this, that places like India, I've been to many of the world, for thousands of years, caves have always been used as sacred sites or for ceremony. And what we know in our tradition mostly is caves are used as burial or touristy or fun or exploration. Um, but ancient people and the original nations, they, they had other uses. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I've done a lot of reading about it and it makes a lot of sense because you're going into another world um, you know, there's an upper world, a middle world, and a lower world. It's not a bad world, it's just a different world. You know, when it's light out here, it's dark in there. When it's cool out here, it's warmer in there. I mean, it's a very interesting, and, and, and you can't, don't have anything to compare it to. Everything's bigger than it really is. So, this cave uh, was wide open when I went in it, and it needed to be protected. 
I mean, you wouldn't buy a, a, a big home, a big expensive home with no door on it, would you? That was completely furnished. Hey, Ruth, Rita, I didn't see you come in. Hey. And um, so it needed a gate. So uh, Dr. Shamick, I had gotten in touch with him. I was doing research about this, and he came across him, and I contacted him, and he got me in touch with the right people. and. And as a matter of fact, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians funded the cave gate. That's how much they needed it, it knew it needed protect. And it was expensive. And it involved 3,000 pounds of steel. And the best cave gate makers to do it. And they, they came here on site and it took four days. You were here, weren't you? Mm -hmm. You remember that. Very different. And it's a fabulous cave. So if you have time, you, you're welcome to go up and take a look at it. I don't, I don't know if we're going to have a, a tour today after the event or not. Uh, we, this was supposed to have been a pre-tour uh, conference, um, Trail of Tears conference that was going to be in Cherokee, North Carolina. And that, um, the Cherokees were coming from Cherokee Nation. Uh, people were coming from the National Park Service from New Mexico. And there was a lot of... Uh, COVID travel restrictions now, um, and so they, they weren't able to attend today. So you're stuck with the girl group today. But uh, I don't know if we're going to have the tour or not. We'll see. But I wanted them to see the cave, and I regret that they're not here today, but they will be. Um, so anyway, what happened was um, the cave gate was built. It's, it's been fabulous. Um, I have the keys in case we need a fallout shelter. And it's been very well protected and respected, and I'm so happy about that. And it's so beautiful. Um, uh, all the grottos, uh, these are chapters of the National Speleological Society. They've come in. Um, it's Cassie and um, Alan Cook here today. They're way in the back. Uh, they have devoted since before day one. I can't tell you how many countless weekends, and they drive from Montevallo here. I love them. I think they love me and the cave. Uh, they have spent the last six weekends here on their days off working to uh, make, make the cave and the grounds up there, the railings and the bridges, um, better. And I can't thank you enough. Stand up and let's say thank you enough. <laughs> great people who, who understand what we're doing. I really appreciate it so much. So this cave gate was built, and it's bat friendly. So the bats have returned, and they roost and, and hibernate in the winter and having their babies. It's fabulous. Don't think these big old bats with teeth and all that business. They're as cute as can be. They're about as big as my pinky. And um, they're just happy as pie in there. So uh, we're happy about that because they contribute a lot to the whole life cycle in the cave. Very, very important. Hummingbird, you just got to laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Did you hear us calling you? I know, this is great. Just look around, look around. This is a great place. So the other the other thing is um, what happened shortly after that, I was still trying to learn. I didn't know anything about any of this. So I went to a conference, uh, the first one I'd ever learned about the, with the preservationists, and I learned about with the Alabama uh, Trust for Historic Preservation and the Alabama Historic Commission um, and I went to, to their conference and I learned about something they called places in peril. Well this place was in peril. You know that. I came out and there was no windows, there was no doors, there was no roof. I mean it was rotten. Um, all the power was gone, all the water was gone, there was no water, no sewage. Uh, bats were roosting up in the in the rafters. Uh, it was a mess. I mean, a big mess. And um, been really closed for 50 years and just used for everything. But Walter Raymond came over here with me, who had built it. And he told me about how this was built, and he told me about the redwood sequoia beams, which looked beautiful in there. And so I nominated it for A Place is in Peril, along with the Lyric Theater, by the way. Lenny, and, and you had that restored in Birmingham. 
she's here today, Lenny Brock, and to you, Glennie. And so it got it. And so I was this Michael Panhorst. And so what came out of that, it was so interesting because he wrote a wonderful article in Alabama Heritage Magazine. I love that magazine. And about this, uh, Places in Peril nomination. And sure enough, someone saw the article, someone who was very interested and called me up and said, meet me at Panera, I think I can help you. And they actually funded the whole roof, decking, and all that had to be done in one week, because everything was held together, so all the concrete had to be repaired. It was quite an undertaking. If you go inside, which I would invite you to do, it's kind of jumbled up right now, but if you go inside, you can see on the wall sort of a regression of uh, some of our life, but you'll see the beams, and you can see how it was with some of the pictures. I try to document stuff and where it's come. And where the office was is now the handicap bathroom. And um, fortunately, we have some heat and air in there now. And it's, we've used it even when there was holes in the roof and no windows and doors. You remember that night we had the uh, chamber meeting here. And actually, there was so much rain and wind that the porta potty blew off the, uh, <laughs> off the property. And it was blowing through that place. And all our food was drenched. But there was no windows or doors. And sometimes people came from all over the country and the world. And we'd sit there in the flood. You know, with that poop floating around. And so it has come a long way. And so it looks just like a little concrete building, but boy, I love it. And so um, I'm really happy to say that. So it's it's no longer, it's a, it's a place is not peril anymore. Um, I'm going to skip over a bunch of things. You'll see the um, display case in there. And in it are a couple things that mostly pictures of things, of gifts, um, that have been done, but that display, the display case itself was donated by the Railroad Museum. So we're kind of partners with them. They got new ones, and I'm so happy to have that. I talked to you already about Bo's thesis and, um, and about this being rehabilitated according to national historic standards. And I've already spoken to you about, um, but wear a mask if you go in because it's small in there. I've talked to you about the published uh, research of Talking Stones uh, with Dr. Uh, Shemek, and uh, it was all this was translated in there by the three federally recognized bands of Cherokee. So it was very important work for them to do together, too. Um, ben Miller's on our board right here. You can stand up, Ben. Ben did some really, really important work. He's with the uh, U.S. Uh, Geologic Survey, he's down here from Nashville, and he spent about six months doing this, um, he did a grant, and he did uh, what they call a recharge, a dye recharge study, and nobody really knew where the water coming in the cave, the pure water floating in the cave down through all the limestone, where it was coming in from. So he did the study, and now we know. And why that's important is because, you see, the water goes in there, and if, then, if all that up there is contaminated from, let's say, agriculture and industry and logging and all the road oil and all the thing, fertilizers, it comes in down there and it comes out in the cave. That's our drinking water, too. So if something happens to snail, you know it's going to happen to us. You see how important that is? So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you so much. And he is, this is kind of his specialty, and he has presented this, uh, this paper uh, and material lots of different places. Um, Catherine Edding, where are you? Catherine's here, and Marie. Marie's our president of our board. She's a, a conservation wildlife vet who works too much everywhere, all <laughs> over the world. But we love her. She loves snakes, so, and things like that, creepy crawler things, right? and reptiles and salamanders and turtles and all that. And um, she, she came last year and brought um, Catherine. And um, they love the K, they're both on the board. Catherine's executive director of the uh, Georgia Alabama Land Trust. And now we have the conservation easement with them, which means this is protected in perpetuity.
I learned that word from watching Shark Tank. <laughs> um, and whatever. <laughs> the other, um, Dr. Matt Nymiller, he um, at the University of Huntsville, and he st he started some uh, really great work along with Ben um, on studying the other critters that the life life. Uh, in, in, in the cave and in the water and takes amazing pictures. Now I'm telling you about this little snail, it's like tiny teensy teensy mm. and there's a picture in there and it's like he makes it this big. I mean you can see everything inside the snail. So it's really amazing work. Thank you so much and I look forward to when you can come back and continue because um, it makes a difference. Um, the last thing that was done here, you can see behind me, this used to be the lake. And on Easter weekend, um, and then over time, it got overgrown, and it became a wetland pond, and I loved it. There was so much wildlife in there. I mean, I loved it. And um, Easter weekend this year, I got a, um, a call from um, Jerome, who, who takes care of the property. He said, the water's gone. Well, I spent Easter day all the, up here, and, and I'd never walked that hole inside there before. All the critters were gone, all the water was gone, but the dam had breached along with the road leading up to the cave. This was flooded out. If you go up there, just be careful. There's a big gully in it that we need to get repaired. And I mean, I was just mm. heartbroken. <clears throat> you know, I didn't know what happened to all the turtles and all the beavers and everything that was living in there. I mean, all the migratory birds. I mean, it was just devastating and, and pretty stinky and nasty. So I do what I always do. I call the experts. And I call them from all over the state. Auburn, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, all of my partners, uh, conservationists. And they said, well, sit, test the soil. We're going to come out. And they met out here. And do you know what they did? Six of them came by the end of April. And they all brought native sedges, grasses, wildflowers, maybe even some endangered ones. And they know they said this is the perfect place for them. This calciferous um, ground. This is where they thrive. It's very special ground um, that is around streams, and the water has been flown, and it's just so rich with. Um, minerals and, and everything because of the wildlife and, and the water itself. And now it's a beautiful, what we call a riparian, uh, ri a spring run meadow. The spring still, the spring still flowed through it. And this was actually the way it was when the Cherokees were here. So what that's what happened. And so what so what I thought was a disaster really wasn't. And so it's we'll see what happens, but it you can walk around and see. Um, so we're very happy about that. And that leads up to today. So I thank you again. And I thank all of you who are the donors, the 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 funders, the grantors, the friends, the volunteers, the workers the boards, um, everyone, and supporters all um, for, for all this. And so I'm going to turn this back over now to Shannon.